So without further ado, I am very, very happy to present Oren Martin. Thank you, Jen. Um, let me just offer a disclaimer here. This is not my turf. This is not my territory. I'm used to standing in a field, in a garden, in an orchard, gesturing, articulating, and demonstrating. But let's give this fall gardening thing a fling on Zoom. Uh, I'm Oren Martin. I work up at the UCSC Farm and Garden Have for uh, more than 43 years um, and have done a lot of teaching of organic farming and gardening. Um, the guesstimate is I've taught over 1,500 undergraduates, uh, over 1,500 of our six month residential uh, apprentices, and over 1,500 uh, of the general public through workshops. So, uh, before we begin, uh, on a note, I'm going to read a few little things and then I'll talk. I won't read the whole time. Uh, uh, so on a note of both hope and optimism as we live in a pandemic, actually a double pandemic. One, a public health pandemic, COVID-19. Yeah, sure. But two, racism is a pandemic too. So some words of hope and inspiration from historian Howard Zinn. To be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however a small way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presence. And to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. So let's talk the small and positive act of fall gardening. A couple of paragraphs from something I had written previously. I have sent along a little uh, uh, thing to Jen that she can send you later, uh, listing uh, some of the varieties I'm going to talk about, sources of tools and seeds, as well as two articles, one uh, on fall gardening and one on spring gardening. So I'll read from the fall gardening on a couple, three paragraphs there. It is amazing, inevitable, and of course, a bit sad to see how rapidly summer slips away. On August 1, we experience 14 hours of daylight. On September 21, we see 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. Where does the time go? Who knows where the time goes? Moving toward fall, despite warm daytime temperatures, the sun seems to slink lower on the horizon. The shadows grow longer, the afternoons fly by in the wink of an eye, the nights grow chilly, sweater weather. Uh, in fall and winter, there are fewer hours of direct sunlight. The days are appreciably shorter, and that light is at a lesser intensity owing to the tilt of the earth as we spin madly through the solar system. Also, cooler temperatures slow down the rate of plant growth. Thus, the term fall winter gardening refers to the time of harvest, not the time of initiation. As unlikely as it seems here on the Central Coast, late July through uh, late September into October is the time to establish a firm foundation for the fall winter garden. There is indeed some great criticality in getting your crops sized up and well established prior to the autumnal equinox, September 21. Then the plants will continue to grow, albeit slowly and fruit head up mature well into winter. Successful direct sowings or transplants put out at two to three week winter intervals should provision for the kitchen larder well into the holiday season. So uh, what's the take home here? Act and act now. Um, and again on the coast here our, our summer is different than the rest of the nation. Um, uh, it, our warmest air, soil, and water temperatures are about August 1-5 through October 1-5. And it's great because we can continue our summer crops well into the fall. Um, but as mentioned, it's critical to get your fall crops going now over the next four to six weeks. Um, you've got to produce a big leafy plant by the time we get, say, to the autumnal, autumnal equinox, September 21, October 1, um, October 15th. And then that plant can gather sunlight, photosynthesize, make sugars, carbohydrates, and grow, 
uh, produce all the parts it needs, root, shoot, leaf, flower, and fruit, and, and, and liberate energy from the carbohydrates as we do to, to grow. But you've got to go now. So it's one of the establishing seeds through direct seeding or transplants. It's one of the things you can do in this time period coming up. And I recommend it. I think maybe a lot of us are from back east and we just have it built into our gardening DNA. Oh, summer's over, let's quit. But we can garden throughout the fall and well into the winter here if you start soon. So you can sow seeds, put out transplants, do this in two to three successive waves, uh, two, three weeks apart, even 10 days, 14 days apart. Uh, now through uh, maybe October 1 to 15th. After that, it's really hard to get things established with a notable exception of quick things like uh, arugula, cutting lettuce, radishes, etc. You can keep going with those things well into the first of the year. Um, so that's one alternative, fall gardening, sowing directly, sowing seeds and transplants. Uh, another would be to uh, establish cover crops. Uh, these are crops that cover the ground, protect the soil from the damaging effect of wind and rain in the winter, uh, and uh, they trap nutrients from leaching downward in the soil profile. And in the case of if you were to use legumes, members of the pea family, principally as cover crops, uh, bell beans, which is just like the fava bean and vetch, they fix nitrogen. They have the ability to be in association with root bacteria, with soil bacteria, and they can fix atmospheric nitrogen in the soil available for your spring uh, crops. Uh, so you can sow seeds, put out transplants, sow a cover crop, uh, and at least two times a year, the home gardener can make a substantial compost pile. One would be in the spring as you clear your weeds and cover, uh, intentional cover crops, uh, leftover uh, uh, vegetation from the winter crops, and the other is at, uh, in the fall as you're cleaning up your garden, getting ready to put in cover crops, mulch, or um, do your uh, fall veg gardening. So those are the possibilities. And sometimes I think fall gardening is easier than spring gardening. Uh, the weather summer into fall is much more steady from warm to cooler to cooler still. Uh, spring is a bit of one step up, two steps back. A rat, uh, although it's bad English, the weather in Santa Cruz is nothing if not erratic in the spring. It's all over the place. And this is hard to get plants established. In fact, the brassicas, the heading broccoli, cauliflower, kale, uh, uh, Asian Napa cabbages and such do much better from mid late summer to into the winter than they do in the spring. Um, and they produce bigger plants that give you a result in bigger head. Uh, so uh, soil's warm, the timing is good. And uh, one note is even though we live in a pretty mild climate, it does get cool here and people live up in the hills all the more so, um, Fall winter crops, particularly root crops, the brassicas, again, when I say brassica, I'm referring to the genus that contains kale, cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, uh, and turnips, and the like. Uh, the root crops, brassicas, and leaf crops will be somewhat to appreciably sweeter in the fall and winter. As the nighttime temperatures get cooler, the plants, uh, in an anthropomorphic sense, sense death. And the way they deal with that or stave off death is they make sugars. Sugar lowers the freezing point. So it's a built-in life insurance policy for them or anti-freeze like that. And we reap the dividend of these crops being much sweeter in the fall than they are in the summer. One notable crop in that regard would be carrots. Sometimes, especially with summer heat, carrots develop uh, kind of, uh, they actually develop turpines. It's turpentine-like. They can be a little bitter and tough, but uh, the uh, fall carrot will be, well, it'll give you all the requisite things you want in a carrot. What's that? Crunch, juice, and sugar. Uh, uh, so uh, it's a good time of year uh, like that. And there's a Sorry. whole class of characters that you can uh, use in your fall garden. Uh, was there a question or something? There is a question, yeah. Um, someone, Jeffrey asks, do we turn our beds again for the fall planting and re-amend? In a word, yep. Uh, so uh, let's take a step back and go into that a little bit. Um, uh, whatever's in your ground now, skim it off, 
take it to the compost pile and make compost. If you want, and the material is not too carbonaceous, that is brown, tough, woody, you can chop it up into small pieces, flip it into the soil, let it rot down for about maybe a week, 10 days, and then plant. Um, uh, but either way, so uh, I would recommend, you know, what you do to your soil in terms of digging is very specific as per, well, how good or bad is your soil now? But generally some sort of digging will be required. Um, and uh, an easy way to do this is to, whatever style of cultivation is a fancy word for digging, whatever style of cultivation or tillage you're going to do, just pre-spread your compost and fertilizer if you like. Um, I find that with a reasonably fertile soil, it's sufficient to use just compost. But if you're not getting good results, a little fertilizer might help. And there are, when I go to the garden centers these days, it's like option paralysis. Uh, there are so many brands of organically certified fertilizer. It's just, you know, baffling like that. And they're all good and they're all 601, half a dozen of the other. Uh, brands I like, Dr. Earth and Gardener and Bloom are really good. Again, these are certified organic and they're good in and of themselves, but they're also laced with mycorrhizal fung fungi. These are a type of fungus that lives in association with your plant roots. And they're basically like some of you who may be a little older might remember hamburger helper in the old days. They're root extenders. They extend the roots, uh, root, root reach of, of your cultivated plants. And they're really efficient at going out, foraging for and grabbing water and nutrients, the nutrients, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, bringing it up into the root zone. And just aiding the plants. So Dr. Earth and Gardener Bloom contain these fungi. Um, another great all-around product is one called Sustain, S-U-S-T-A-N-E, a play on the word sustain. And uh, it comes in two formulations, one with 4% nitrogen, one with 8% nitrogen, and both are good. Um, so uh, I would skim, remove vegetation, make compost, uh, just a thin layer of compost and some uh, fertilizer, if you wish, uh, and then engage in digging, and then you're ready to plant. Let's talk a little about sources. Um, uh, if you, uh, I guess we're really lucky in this town that we have two really great nurseries, San Lorenzo Garden Center down on uh, River Street, and uh, Ray Schmidt and his posse are really qualified uh, personnel there and up the north end of Mission, Charlie and Maria and their uh, crew uh, at the garden company. Um, these are uh, places that have seeds on the rack that are, that are great and they have excellent uh, six packs uh, starts. Uh, they do business with a company called Upstarts which produces a quality organic seedling uh, and they carry an excellent brand uh, uh, array of different seed company seeds uh, on their racks and I'm just going to list off a few and these are ones that I do business with uh, a lot. One is called Botanical Interests and it has an amazing array of annual uh, vegetables and annual and perennial flowers and herbs and they're almost all organic. Uh, a local uh, person and a good friend, Renee Shepherds, Renee's Seeds and I don't think in 30 something years Renee has ever offered a variety that wasn't par excellence. She just searches the world around literally for good vegetable and flower varieties. And it, for those of you who like sweet peas, she is a sweet pea aficionado. All 30 or so of the varieties of sweet peas she carries are excellent uh, like that. We have a, another question in the chat. Sure. How long do I need to wait to harvest my sweet peas that I let go to seed to replant? Um, well, uh, by now they should be turning brown uh, and uh, you should keep an eye on the pods. Uh, they should go from a green to a light yellow, a dark yellow brown, and you better watch out because at some point uh, it's part of their evolutionary strategy for survival, seed dispersal, they'll twist and scatter their seeds. Uh, and when you, you can just go and just break open a pod and when a seed is immature, it'll be watery and then it'll be milky, the internal and then doughy. And then when it's hard and sweet pea seed uh, coat gets really hard and you can't penetrate, it's time to take the seed. So let me run by uh, run uh, a few more seed companies by, by you that are carried locally. Lake Valley um, and Franchi Seeds, which is an Italian seed company and 
they've got uh, amazing varieties. High mowing seeds, which is in Vermont, is offered at a garden company on the north end of Mission, and all their seeds are organic. A uh, couple uh, mail order uh, online uh, companies I like. One, one has kind of become my one-stop shop for seeds is Johnny's Selected Seeds there in Maine. Um, and they have a good amount, amount, array of organic, uh, both flowers and vegetables. And what they, they're, they're good for you if you're a small backyard gardener or a big grower. They'll offer seeds in what they call mini packs, which only have 20 seeds, it's good. All, all the way up to ounces and pounds if you're a big grower. Um, and uh, they have excellent fries. So uh, seeds or starts, uh, local, fine. Online, you can get, um, uh, a, a whole array of, of, of seeds, a couple other really good. If you're interested in heirloom seeds, Baker, seed, Baker Creek seeds are good. Uh, and so, uh, so is a couple other companies with a similar name, Seeds of Change in New Mexico and Seed Savers Exchange in Iowa. So uh, you wanna think, do I wanna go direct seed or do I wanna, put out transplants with root crops and quick maturing leaf crops like arugula, cutting lettuce, salad greens, you want a direct seed. Um, and with all others, I recommend transplants. One of the, some of the advantages of transplants or the principal advantage of transplants, you put out a pretty big plant maybe with four to six leaves um, and it's easier to tend than to get a single seed to germinate and grow. Um, you probably got about a, uh, four to five week jump on maturation by using a transplant over a, uh, a direct seeded crop. Again, root crops and quick things, direct seed, all others transplant. Um, but this idea of putting out a transplant gives you a jump start on the weeds. You have a bigger plant that can be ahead of the weeds. And since I brought up weeds, let's talk about weeding. Um, one of the things in the world of organic gardening is we only have one mean means, one mean, to control weeds. And those are me that's mechanical means. We can knock them down and usually you knock them down with a hoe or you hand weed. I'm going to recommend two tools to you. One is called the collinear hoe. It's developed by Elliot Coleman, a really great New England uh, intensive farmer. Uh, and uh, it's a, a, just a very thin, sharp blade about that. One is four inches and one is six inches uh, wide. And it's, it's, it's a, uh, meant to get, it's kind of like a preemptive strike. Uh, it's meant to get weeds when they're very young before they've offered too much competition to your plants. And one of the spectacular things about it is the old chopping hoes are rather coarse and you have to bend over and they're hard on the back. This hoe is designed to stand up straight and you hold it with your thumbs up or like you're dancing, ballroom dancing, who does that anymore, I don't know. Um, and it's just, you just drag it across the surface of the soil. And if you do it early enough, you get weeds, what's called the, the white thread stage. They're just either emerge or not quite emerged, and you see a little white at the base of the stem and you knock them down. If the weeds get a little bigger, another excellent tool is called the hula hoe or the stirrup hoe. It's a reciprocating hoe that you drag through the soil like that. But the collinear hoe is great. And if you want a real treat, look on YouTube and look, uh, uh, Google Elliot Coleman, a collinear hoe. And you have this, I don't know, 80 year old guy whipping down a lettuce bed faster than you and I could ever go with this exquisite tool. So um, when you're setting your rows, think about, well, how are you gonna weed? If you're gonna use a hoe, what's the width of the hoe? And again, these two hoes I'm referring to, the collinear and the hula hoe, come in four and six inch widths. So I would just make my rows about two or three inch wider than that, so I can drag the hole down between the rows and not uh, hit the plants like that. Um, we have two more questions, okay. Lauren. Uh, the first one is, are there any great garden centers in mid or south county? There. Well, maybe. I hardly ever get down there. Um, Aladdin Nursery uh, in Coralitos is excellent, uh, but I'm, I'm sad to say I, <laughs> they keep me on a short leash up at the UC farm. I, I, I'm not aware of anything further south than, than Coralitos. So, um, and uh, let me say, you can shop at, you know, uh, Lowe's or Kmart or all, all those kind of places. And they may or may not have 
uh, quality seedlings. Uh, it's really important to get a quality seedling. One thing is wherever you're getting your seedlings, ask them how often they get their shipments and get there right after that. Uh, and then when no one's looking, just pop one of the seedlings out of the six pack tray and look at the root. You need enough root mass that it's knit so it'll facilitate an easy transplant without any root disturbance, no shock. And yet you don't, and white roots are live roots, brown roots, not so much. And you wanna stay away from anything that's, that's pot bound or uh, uh, like that. Uh, with quick growing crops like fall vegetables, they're not probably gonna recover from that. So be a smart shopper. Um, let's talk some of the cast of char characters here, but let me also say, uh, don't forget fall flowers. And on the list I, uh, sent to Jen is a list of my recommended annual fall flowers here. But let's talk uh, veg crops a little bit. Um, before, we, before we move on, I'm sorry <laughs> to keep interrupting. Um, there, are, there are the other questions I mentioned. Um, I, collected, I collected the seeds from an open, oh, from an open pollinated, where'd it go? Oh, I collected the seeds from an open pollinated celery. Will those produce similar celery? Uh, the next question is, please recommend the best hand pruner for roses and such. And the last one is, I have three six-foot stock tanks that I plant in. I'd love to plant kale, carrots, and snap peas this winter. Do I plant them in separate tanks, or do I put them all each in the same tank? All right, let's unpack those three. Rapid oh. fire. Repeat <laughs> briefly. The first one was. The first one was I collected the seeds from an open pollinated Except, celery. Will those uh, produce uh, similar celery? Yeah, if it's an open pollinated non hybrid variety, it should be good. Um, a lot of seeds have a little bit of a, uh, a chemical inhibition uh, to germinate for a month or so off the plant. But after that, they should germinate just fine. Let me also say this about celery, and it applies also to uh, lettuce, um, is they have a built-in thermo dormancy. They don't like to germinate when the soil temps are much above 75 degrees. So um, if we get into a hot August stretch, it might be better to wait until September. But yeah, you, you can do celery. And celery can be put out as transplants now. Uh, and let me just bridge off of that and say, uh, y'all should check out celeriac. It's um, a celery root. It's the gnarliest, warted, funniest looking thing you ever saw. Once you peel it and either steam or roast it, um, it's uh, out of this world, got a lot of the texture of a good mashed potato, but with that umble zing like carrots and dill and cilantro has. And a couple of years ago, my daughter brought to a Thanksgiving pot, uh, potluck we had uh, celeriac au gratin, gone in a New York minute. It's amazing. Another great thing in terms of combo crops is take potatoes, take parsnips, and take celeriac, uh, steam them and mash them all together put them on the table with, of course, the uh, butter, salt, and pepper, and it's uh, quite a, a textural and taste thing. Second question. Yes, uh, a recommendation request for the best hand pruner for roses and such. Yeah, for 40-something years, I've always recommended the Swiss tool uh, for hand pruner, uh, uh, Felco, uh, and uh, they have a bunch of different sizes. Uh, I prefer the number two, but you might want to go to the garden centers and check out the what size what, what size fits your hand well. Well, that was then. This is now. About five years ago, we discovered a different hand pruner. Uh, it's from a Japanese conglomerate, and it's uh, uh, ARS is the brand. We don't know what it stands for, but we've nicknamed it Always Really Sharp. It has an amazing steel blade. I've had mine for about two years and haven't had to shop, sharpen them. Uh, they're amazing. Uh, they also have quick release. They cost a few more bucks than the Felco, but Felco or ARS is the way to go. And uh, just like any craft, you know, a quality tool is an important thing, especially if you're doing pruning of roses and trees, you want to make a clean cut. So a good uh, bypass uh, pruner like Felco or uh, ARS is where you want to be. And the last one was about the growing situation. Uh, yes. Well, another one came in while you were talking, but uh, we'll get to this one first. Uh, I have three six-foot stock tanks that I plant in. I'd love to plant kale, carrots, and snap peas this winter. Do I plant them in separate tanks, or can I do them all in each tank? Um, I would do them in separate tanks. Uh, the sure snaps are going to billow out even the, the dwarf types and take over ground. And uh, 
kale you get a little bigger plant with a little better leaves if it has some good spacing in between it so i do them in separate tanks so those are three excellent crops this time of year i might add and what's the one that just came in uh would any of the following be inappropriate for august planting edamame soybean peas celtus and salsify uh wow uh edamame uh oh so good i get a new leaf in the frozen food section they don't grow well here there are real soybeans are uh, uh and uh, uh i've had fresh soybeans and they're just a cut above um uh but they don't grow well here they need heat and a little humidity we we don't have enough heat here um i've grown them and i've grown varieties that are touted to be cool season edamames one is their summer crop not a fall crop um and it's so cute i got a plant like this with one little edamame so i don't recommend them here would that we could uh what were the other uh salsify is uh also called oyster root yeah it's a great uh really underappreciated unsung uh fall crop you would sow it now through early october direct seed it as you would carrots or parsnips or any other root crop um, let's talk about root crops a little bit here and talk about seeding rate generally one to two maybe two to three seeds per inch will do the trick um, people sow so thickly that it's a psychological barrier to get in there and thin and then it's if things are sown really thickly it is no matter how careful you are it's injurious to the plants you leave behind so seed at a reasonable rate one to two two to three seeds per inch um, and what was the so the, what was the other crop before the salsify um, Celtus and peas. Uh, wow. Uh, Celtus or Celtus um, is uh, kind of a bolting lettuce. Yeah, it's a good time of year. Uh, it's, it's, it's a uh, uh, really uh, renowned, appreciated in the so Southeast Asia. And it's a lettuce, but it's an aberrant lettuce. And it grows and looks like a romaine for a while. And then it makes this big, thick stalk and sends it up get a couple three feet tall uh, and uh, you harvest it at that point strip the leaves skin it and uh, uh, you can steam it uh, but this is a good time of year for all three of those crops are there other questions here not yet let me plow on here let's talk wow. carrots a little bit um, this time of year carrots would be about 50 60 days to maturation depending on the variety as you get into mid late september it'll be another 10 or 15 days on top of that and uh, there are many, many classes of carrots. And I'm uh, uh, gonna recommend one, maybe two. And those are the types that are called nantes, N-A-N-T-E-S. It's uh, a lot of the carrots we have in uh, agriculture now are, were bred in France, so they have French names, nantes, N-A-N-T-E-S. It looks a lot like Groucho Marx's cigar. <clears throat> Tastes appreciably better on that. Uh, about five, six inches long, blunt tip. And it has, again, all that. It, it's probably the best fresh eating type of carrot. And there are many varieties. So nantes types and a couple, three, couple, three, four that I like this time of year, two, from Johnny's, one called Napoli and the other called Bolero. And again, these are on the handout. Uh, and from Territorial Seeds up in Oregon. And one of the reasons I like Territorial Seeds is because they feature crops, they're in the Willamette Valley, and they feature crops that are good for cool season areas such as ours. So across the board, they have really appropriate varieties for us. Two uh, uh, nonce type, uh, uh, actually one nonce type uh, carrot, they have Eskimo. And the other is called Giant of Colmar. And it's a little longer, it's about 10 inches long. Um, so those are some uh, carrot variety recommendations. Baby carrots, my response is, why? Okay, it's about the same time to maturation for one quarter of the biomass. It's just, it doesn't grow real carrots. Um, okay, beets, uh, I'm so, uh, uh, there are another uh, root crop direct zone 50 60 days to maturation at this time of year um, oh let me just stop here and say that one of the great things about our climate in the winter is if you can establish your root crops they're fully formed by say november december the ref the ground acts as a refrigerator here in santa cruz you can let them sit in the ground and harvest them incrementally as you want um, so beets about 50 60 days at this time of year um, uh, uh, to maturation, be 60 to 70, 75 as you get uh, into October. 
Um, and the beet seed is not a seed, but a fruit. So there are usually two or three seeds in that little corkscrew thing that looks like a seed. So you'll say, you know, I sowed these with precision accuracy and I have so many, that's the way it is. I recommend one or two seeds every two inches with beets and then thin out. With, with, with thinning of root crops, think of the shoulders of the crop, the radish, about like that, an inch or so. That's the distance you need to thin to. The carrot, inch and a half. Beets are three or four inches and they need a good five inches uh, between plants at, at thinning, um, like that. Um, there are uh, quite an array of uh, beet varieties. I have to say I'm old school and stuck. I've been growing the same variety for 40 years. And let me tell you, I like to grow every variety I can get my hands on just to check it out. But uh, uh, Red Ace, it was good in 1970 and it's good now. It's uh, uh, pretty quick, uh, pretty big, uh, beautiful blood red, and it's sweet. And one of the things I really like about it is that it holds well at maturation for two or three months in, uh, throughout the winter uh, like that. There are other ones and they're really lovely to look at. The Chiogia or candy stripe beet, the golden beet, um, and the white beet. The white beet maybe I can go for it because it comes from the sugar beet. So it's a little bit sh sweet, but it's a little hairy and rough. So um, my uh, recommendation is just red ace. Uh, but uh, a couple other uh, beets, if you wanna do any type of canning or preserving with beets, uh, there are cylindrical, uh, elongated beets, much like a carrot. One variety called Cylindra and one called Formanova, and they're both uh, good. Uh, like that. Beet greens are great if you like them. Beet greens are a lot like cilantro. People either seem to love it and will put it in everything or can't be in the same room with them. Uh, beet greens have a little salty taste to them and this has to do with the origin of beets. Beets are native to the Mediterranean rim, uh, river mouths, bogs, estuaries, where you have brackish water, a mix of salt and, and fresh water. So that's one of the reasons they developed a deep taproot to go down and mine into fresh water. And salt, how shall I put it, family program here, messes up the metabolism of plants. It, it, they won't, will not perform well with any appreciable salt in the soil. So the beet has developed this strategy evolutionarily to pump the salt out of the leaf into the vacuole, which is basically a dump, a hole in the center of the leaf. Um, so the rest of the leaf can function in a vascular sense. And so when you steam or eat beet greens, they're going to be a little salty. You like, you don't like, don't blame the beet, that's the way it's supposed to taste. Um, and I, I, I like beet greens a lot, but I really like beet greens in a salad mix format. And the probably best variety in that re, uh, regard is one called uh, Bowl's Blood. Uh, and it's a great, just metallic red, nice little uh, uh, salad uh, uh, beet leaf like that. Radishes, um, I don't think there's a bad variety of radishes on the market. Uh, and they're quick. The books say 22 to 28 days. I've never seen one mature in less than about 28, 30 days. Um, and again, as you go further into October, November, it'll be at another 10 or 15 days to the maturation date. They're all good. Uh, but there's another class of radishes that I think you might want to check out. They're called winter radishes and they're often associated with Italy, Germany, and Spain. Um, and uh, one great one uh, from Italy is called Nero Tondo, and that just means round and black. And one from Germany called Runder Schwarzer, which means again, round and black. And they're big, they're almost beet size, and they have a rough exterior black and a pure white interior. And they give rise to, in my uh, in-laws uh, are Bavarian, and they give rise to, uh, Pints and radishes, what they do is they take these winter radishes, which mature in 50, 60, 70 days, they take a while, um, and they slice them paper thin, and they put them in a bowl, and they have a bowl of salt, and they have a fork, and they jab a slice of radish, and they put it in the salt, and they plunk it in their mouth, and of course, being Bavarians, they have a stein lager next to them, and they take a slug. It's really good. Um, uh, and another great uh, fall winter uh, radish is red meat or watermelon radish, strikingly beautiful. Again, a little longer maturation, 50 days, 60 days, and kind of big. Uh, and it's kind of the chartreuse green and white on the outside and watermelon red on the inside. And it is both sweet and spicy. Um, 
Going to give a little plug to turnips, not everybody's favorite, not, not my favorite I, either, but there are uh, a couple varieties that are small and white and sweet. And they're uh, both of uh, Japanese origin. One is called Hakerei, H-A-K-E-R-E-I, and the other is called Mikado. Uh, and they're really sweet. Um, I mentioned parsnips before. Uh, parsnips are long and they take a long time to mature, 100, 120 days from sowing to maturation. And they need a nice, open, deep, sandy soil to mature. If you don't have that soil, you can still grow parsnips. You know what you need to do? You need to get a PhD. That is a post hole digger. And you just boom, take the soil out and improve it with, you know, 30, 40% compost and the rest native sale. So I'll put it back in and then direct sow your, your parsnips. You probably can get four or five plants in a post hole uh, size like that, but yeah, get a PhD. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the heading brassicas. Uh, uh, let me just say kale and leeks are the two most cold tolerant of all the vegetables. Even in New England, they can grow through the winter. And uh, all kale varieties are great. Some look different. I don't think they taste that different, uh, but they're all great. Uh, another way you can run kale is you can set them out at you know, 10, 12 inch spacing, get a full plant with full size leaf. It's all good. Um, but you can uh, run them as a, a salad mix. Uh, and you can buy a bunch of different varieties, mixing them together, or Johnny's has a, 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 a blend they call calibration. Uh, and you just scatter sow, direct sow them, maybe the seeds are a uh, quarter, eight in, inch apart, and you treat it like a salad mix, a cut and come again thing. Really nice, tender uh, young things. But the, the heading brassicas, in order of ease to difficulty, cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower. Fall again is the time of, Summer into fall is the time to grow these crops. The plant will get big, bigger. The bigger the plant when it goes to heading, the bigger the resultant uh, head. And this is another instance where I might use a little bit of fertilizer around my broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage sets to get a bigger plant. So I'll get a bigger head uh, like that. Um, uh, with with uh, 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 cauliflower, it seems sometimes you can do everything right and all you have to do is look at it cross-eyed it goes all right. It's the most difficult, but again, fall crops are surer than spring crops. With, with uh, cauliflower, a couple recommended varieties, uh, one called Amazing, and it is, and another that yeah, seems appropriate for the weather in the fall, Denali. Um, and with broccoli, uh, uh, I usually start out with Gypsy, now into the fall, and then move to Marathon and Acadia. Marathon and Acadia will take quite a while to head up. They might even not mature into February, but they're a really nice overwintering uh, type of broccoli. Um, with cabbages, I'm wild about two things, small cabbages, sweet cabbage, well, three things, small, sweet, and pointy-headed. And uh, uh, Johnny's has an excellent variety called Caraflex. It's about one to two pounds, and I don't, we don't ever cook these cabbages in the house. Here's the deal. Bring home some, some, some pointy-headed cabbages, uh, tender and sweet. Uh, bring home some carrots, Put them in a Cuisinart, uh, apply, make up an Asian dressing, plate them up, scatter some scallions and walnuts on top, good to go. Uh, like that. But Caraflex from Johnny's is an excellent small pointy headed uh, cabbage. And as you might suspect from the name, Conehead from Renee's. And uh, then she has another one, Pointed sweet, Sweetheart, are both excellent small. And she also has this cute little one pound sweet round cabbage called Pixie. Um, and uh, I also like, especially as we go into the fall and winter, Savoy type, Savoy type cabbage. They're crinkle leaf, they're beautiful, and they're a little more substance in terms of food. And they're both, they have that full cabbage flavor, but they're also uh, a little sweet. So Savoy, Savoy types uh, like that. Um, okay, um, spinach, uh, time of year to grow spinach is spring and fall. Uh, summer is hard, they, it, they don't like heat, and they don't like long days, so they tend to bolt or go to seed. There are two types of spinach, smooth leaf and savoy. Savoy plants are big, deep, dark, crinkled, thick leaves, and the plants are upright, which I like because mud doesn't splash up onto the foliage. Uh, and the, uh, for salad makes you want the smooth leaf types. They're lower growing to the ground and smooth leaf, and they kind of melt in your mouth. Um, uh, so uh, 
uh, gazelle is a good uh, smooth leaf type from Johnny's at this time of year. There's another one that's oh, done taste any different, but it's also oh cute. Is red kitten has a red stem and the veins on the leaf are red. Um, but there's a, a a a few varieties that are old throwbacks, and I highly recommend it only as fall winter spinaches. They bolt like crazy, go to seed in the spring and summer. And one is called Bloomsdale or Bloomsdale Long Standing, and two that are uh, uh, this is not a, a, a fisherman's tale here, a fisher person's tale. One called, gotta pardon my French, Jean Diver, Giant of Winter, and Monstro de Virofly, monster like big. Virofly is a region in France. And they have literally, again, no lie, 10, 12 inch long leaves that are succulent, melt in your mouth. They're, they're, they're the best spinach hands down you ever got to taste. Baker seed. Uh, Baker Creek Seed carries them, and you can look around, no doubt, online and find other sources. Someone mentioned peas. Let's talk peas a little bit. Um, uh, there are three types of peas, snow, snap, and pod. Snow peas are kind of de rigueur with Asian cooking, and I've, again, tried, probably trialed 30, 40, 50 varieties of the different types of peas, each of the different types of peas, and I've settled on uh, Oregon Giant. It's kind of... Uh, uh, Hits that sweet spot between good production and really good uh, uh, taste. Uh, snap peas, that's to eat the whole thing. Uh, the original sugar snap pea was a nine, 10 foot tall vine. It was out of this world. We used to have to harvest it with an orchard ladder, a little impractical, and it gets mildew like nobody's business. They've improved it and brought it down in size. So there's an improved sugar snap. It's still a vigorous bush, about four feet high, needs some uh, high, needs some trellising but it is really good. Cascadia and Sugar Ann are also other good uh, uh, snap peas. Uh, again, with, uh, uh, as with the snow pea, uh, there's one variety that's superior to all the rest and it's called Maxi Gold, M-A-X-I-G-O-L-T again from uh, Johnny's. Uh, let's see, I can wrap up the varietal overview and then we can open it up to question with, uh, let's talk onions briefly here. Uh, you can set onions out anytime in September and October, and you can set them out again in January, transplants in January, February. But you want to make sure you're getting varieties that are classified as intermediate day varieties. Onions come in short, intermediate, and long day varieties. Uh, short day varieties are for southern gardeners. Um, long day varieties take in excess of 15 hours of day length to trigger bulbing. We only get to 14 hours and 48 minutes of uh, daylight here. You grow a long day variety, you're gonna have a big scallion. So intermediate day varieties are for the ones that are for our area. Um, and uh, a couple of good yellow ones, one is called Expression and one is called Zoe. The USDA classifies vegetables by size and uh, uh, the top of the size class is Jumbo and Colossal and this Zoe. Uh, will get you colossal sized uh, uh, onions. The best red I've found is Cabernet. Uh, another great onion, there's no reason the, the Cipollini flat Italian onions, they go for three, four, five bucks a pound in the market, so no more difficult to grow than any other onion. And one variety that does well here is Bianca di Maggio, that's white of May, and in Sicily it matures in May here, it uh, matures in July. Uh, another great onion would be uh, any of the torpedo onions, the long Italian torpedo onions. The best thing to do is slice them longitudinally, slather them with a little balsamic and olive oil, put them on the barbie uh, like that. Um, there are all kinds of lettuces, of course, and they do well in, in the fall. I'm going to mention two classes here. One of the oak leaf types, which are pretty and tasty. Uh, leaf lettuces mature quicker than any other lettuce, and they're both the most heat and cold tolerant. And three I like are all French varieties. Uh, one is called Panisse, which has a kind of lime green foliage and it's just melt in your mouth. You can put the plants four to six inches apart and produce a small mini head, or put them eight to 10 inches apart and produce a nice big uh, uh, loose leaf, uh, oak leaf uh, uh, head. Uh, two other French varieties, and again, these are all from Johnny's Seeds. Uh, Again, you have to pardon my French. Rui, R-O-U-X-A-I-I, -I, and uh, Oscard, O-S-C-A-R-D-E. Again, these varieties are on the, on the handout. 
the other class that uh, there's no reason you should have to go to the farmer's market and pay a buck and a half for a head of a little mini little gem. They're excellent. They're a natural cross between a butter letter, succulent and buttery on the inside, and the crisp, nice uh, outside is romaine-like. And you can produce them yourself quite easily. And the deal is you can produce them in, with, in, a, in a, a lot in a small area. You can space them four to six inches apart. They mature in about 40 to 50 days. Um, a little gem is the variety that named the class, little gem lettuces. Bambi is an improved one. It's just a little tougher and prettier and all that. Tastes about the same. And it's hard to get a good red uh, little gem, uh, uh, but one with a name that they should lose the brand and find a better sounding name. Segolane, C-E-G-O-L-A-I-N-E. -E. So uh, maybe I can stop now and, and uh, oh, no, I can't stop. I can't stop. <laughs> uh, uh, hit the mute, would you, Jen? Um, uh, leeks, again, another un underappreciated unsung uh, vegetable. It doesn't come into its prime until well into fall, winter. And it's the exception to the rule. Like, unlike zucchinis, bigger is better. It's sweeter, it's meatier, there's more food stuff there. One old throwback variety is King Richard, and one modern hybrid is Megaton, and it grows really quick. <clears throat> for a leak, which is to say, not very quick at all, but they're good. Uh, and, and again, uh, hey, there ain't never been no such thing as a bad leak, bad as that English is. They're all good varieties. Um, but Megaton and King Richards, I find to be a cut above. Um, okay, questions? You want some questions? Sure. All right, I'm gonna try to like, consolidate. I know we're a little bit short on time and we can run over if you're comfortable running over. Um, I don't have anything to be. The Giants, uh, First pitch against Houston was a 6-10, but I can deal with that. <laughs> All right. Okay, so um, the first two are sort of similar. Can you suggest three to five plantings for first-time gardeners, or what are your top 10 fall crops to plant? Uh, okay. Um, okay, uh, let's kind of ease into a, a degree of difficulty or lack thereof. Um, uh, radishes. Uh, uh, Lettuces, whether you direct sow, scatter sow uh, for cutting lettuce, uh, you can have them about 20 or 30 days, or you set out plants, uh, uh, transplants, uh, should be pretty easy. If you don't overdo it with your enthusiasm, enthusiasm is a good thing, of course, and you don't overseed, uh, carrots are a pretty sure thing in the fall. Now they take 10 to 14 days to germinate, and this used to be a problem. People go off to work. Oh, well, that's not happening so much these days. You'll have to sprinkle them once or twice a day, but maybe it's a good thing out of a bad thing, this pandemic. You can be around to water your carrot seeds. Um, uh, but carrots are pretty good. And uh, uh, something that will aid you, whether you're a beginning, a novice, or an expert, is Johnny Seeds carries uh, pelleted carrots, carrot seeds. So it makes the seed appreciably bigger and rounder and so much easier to handle and seed a little more precisely, like I said. One to two seeds per inch will do it. Uh, so radishes, carrots, uh, lettuces, um, uh, kale. Kale is kind of a, you can't go wrong. It's uh, uh, pretty easy. The heading brassicas, again, as I said, cabbage is easier than broccoli. And those two are easier than cauliflower. Um, leeks are just stalwart, intrepid. Uh, put them out. They're, they're, that English again. Ain't nothing go wrong with leeks. All you got to do is be patient and wait 90, 100 days to get them sized up and, and eat. Um, onions are a little tricky and they're a little disease prone, but doable. Um, uh, so anyhow, th there would be some suggestions for the kind of entree into veg crops. So speaking of onions, uh, when are onions ready or when should one harvest onions? Um, yeah, uh, they say patience is a virtue, so be virtuous. Um, you put them out in the fall, and again, you can, another excellent time is January and February. Once you put out in the fall, we'll start to bulb up in April and be fully mature in late June, July. Uh, the ones you put out in January will be July into August. Uh, indicators of the plant will grow, be lush and green, start to make a bulb. The bulb will enlarge, often push up out of the ground. The foliage will start to get ratty, yellow, Senesce, die back, 
And as it starts to flop, when maybe about 25, 50% of your plants are flopping, it's a good time to come in and just press the tops over, break them off, stop watering, wait 10 days, two weeks, and lift your onions and store them in a dry, dark, cool place like that. But a real treat in growing onions in a home garden is what are called spring onions. Again, you needn't pay five bucks a pound at New Leaf. You can grow your own. And, and a spring onion is just, the reference is a young onion with a green top intact, and the bulb could be, you know, a ping pong ball to full size. And they are a more nutritious because there's a lot of nutrition in the greens and they are sweet and they are light and they are out of this world. So I usually uh, put my one strategy is to put your onions at uh, twice the density you might, uh, maybe three inches apart and then thin out every other one in the spring for spring onions, let the others mature. Um, let me say a word about weeds and onions or alliums, which is a genus for onions, scallions, uh, shallots, uh, leeks, garlic, and the like. You can have alliums or you can have weeds, but you can't have both. And again, they're in the ground for six, eight months, and you, you might do a half a dozen or more weedings. You've, they, have, they have really narrow uh, leaves leaf system, not good at competing with aggressive broad leaf weeds, and a re just virtually no roots. I don't know how they grow <laughs> like this, like that. Uh, and so they're very poor competitors with weeds. So you want to be on your game with weeding of onions. Um, we had, we've had a couple of questions about gophers. Um, how do you discourage gophers? Are there any particularly gopher proof crops? How do you deal with them? <laughs> he laughs. Um, uh, I don't know of any edible vegetables that are gopher proof. <laughs> In fact, some are uh, filet mignon or chocolate, chocolate truffles for gophers. Um, uh, you've got to trap and you've got to be pretty regular about it. If you don't want to trap, you can put gopher netting under your beds, but it's a hay of a lot of work. If you have raised, wooden raised beds, it's easier to do that when you install them. Um, but, uh, the, but you really have to trap. The trap of choice these days is a thing called the cinch trap, uh, which it's so ridiculously easy to set uh, unlike the old Maccabees and such, you don't have to dig down and find the tunnel. You just, you, you, you want to patrol your garden every morning to see any fresh disturbances and get them then. And you see an opening, you just stick the trap down. If you don't want to trap, if you're not good at trapping, if it gives you the heebie-jeebies or whatever, um, Thomas Whitman, who's a good friend and a former colleague, has a business called Gophers Limited. And he will come out and get those varmints. Whatever varmint you have, he'll get it. He'll also teach you, if you want, how to trap. Uh, so that's my recommendation. But, uh, and then there are areas, there are some meadows and sandy soils that are just gopher, gopher ridden like nobody's business. And in those instances, it's probably better at the outset to get some gopher wire. Don't get chicken wire. Don't get two inch chicken wire. The gophers could go right through it. Get some aviary wire or gopher wire and line the beds uh, and cove it up to the surface um, uh, with, with the, the gopher wire. Okay. Uh, should you avoid adding leaves with mildew to your compost? Uh, compost is kind of a great remedi remediator uh, with a few exceptions. Uh, you can add disease material, and in the process of decomposition, the life cycle of the disease is disrupted, so you need to worry. Mildew, mildew is a huge problem on the coast here, with summer squash, with winter squash, uh, with peas at the end of their cycle, uh, but it, it's, it's not that big of an, uh, a deal. So somebody, let me go a little on compost here, which is that the home gardener's dilemma a lot of gooey goppy kitchen scraps and that's about it. So what I would recommend is get a bale of straw, straw not hay, hay has seeds, that's not what you want to introduce into your garden. Uh, get some leaves, any kind of deciduous leaf. If you can, get some manure. Down on the coast, uh, coast staples, uh, stables, uh, you can drive in and get a bucket or a truckload as you wish. But have these other ingredients there besides your uh, kitchen scraps and your garden waste and just lay, make thin and repetitive layers as you go. So you come out with your kitchen scraps, put a thin one inch layer, 
put that put down some straw put another layer put down some straw like that um but i don't think you have to worry too much about mildewed leaves in the uh, compost okay my carrots are always twisted not straight and long what am i doing wrong <clears throat> well uh there may be several answers here. One might be spacing. The carrots are too close together, they entwine. It's kind of beautiful, but not what you want. The other thing is carrots need an open, deep soil. And sa a sandy soil <coughs> will always grow a better carrot than a clay soil, even though the clay soil has more nutrients than the sandy soil. It's just open and easier for that root to penetrate. Um, so if you don't have a deep soil, an open soil, a light soil, um, I would recommend some deep digging and the addition of compost. <clears throat> Again, as I recommended, if you pre-apply compost before you dig, whatever depth you dig to, that compost will be uniformly distributed in a vertical fashion like that. Hang on, I gotta grab a glass of water here while you ask the next question. Um, are there any crops, lettuce, brassicas, etc., that grow with minimum sunlight. I have a window of three to four hours a day in my planting area. Yeah, sketchy. Um, generally, for good production, you're gonna need six to eight hours of sunlight. If you are in a marginal area, uh, leaf crops will do better than any crop. That, brassicas are out of the question, unless it's kale. So leaf lettuce, uh, kale, um, maybe radishes, give them a shot. All right, we've only got a couple left. You're doing great. <laughs> um, can you recommend Chinese brassica vegetables for Santa Cruz? Oh boy, we've got three hours. Um, I'm a huge fan of uh, a a Asian greens. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about the Napa heading types. Uh, uh, again, this is the time of year to grow, grow them. Um, small Napa cabbages, two excellent varieties, one from Rene Shepherd called Little Jade and one from Johnny's Seeds called Minuet. You want to go big and these can get to be three to five pounds. Rubicon and uh, Bilko uh, from Johnny's and then check out uh, one seed company I neglected to mention is George Kitasawa. They're over in San Jose and it's like the fourth or fifth generation. They've been around for a hundred years and they have all manner of Asian greens. Uh, but the, the heading Napa types are excellent. Um, and then the non-heading pak choy types are good. The, uh, min, m any of the mini types are great. They're all six of one, half a dozen to the other. Some are red and some are white stem, some are green stem, and they all taste about the same and they all do really well at this time of year. Uh, but one of the pak choys, again, a non-heading Chinese cabbage uh, is bigger and just pretty as all get out, maybe a little crunchier too, uh, called joy choy, J-O-I-C-H-O-I. And it's got, to me, everything you want from a, a non-heading pak choy. Uh, the stem is crunchy and juicy, and the leaf is sweet, but a little peppery too. Um, if you look in Johnny's Seeds, as well as Kitasawa, they have uh, a whole array of Asian greens, many Mizuna types, which are a mild mustard, uh, like that, uh, yeah. And let me, let me also add on to that, that in this same, t let's take the Napa heading Chinese cabbage uh, or any of these other Asian greens. In about the same time it takes to produce a lettuce, you're gonna get so much more nutrition from these particularly darker colored uh, Asian greens than you do from a, a lettuce. Lettuce is good, but it's not a real nutritional bonanza. Um, can, or let's see, what about flowers? Eh, they're all right. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, vegetables, food for the body, flowers, food for the spirit and soul. Uh, the price of flowers is never cheap. You can grow your own for pennies a plant. Um, another big reason, so why grow flowers? Aesthetics, they're drop dead beautiful. Drop the mic, good enough for me. Money, if save you money from buying bouquets or if you're selling you can make money off of flowers um, and the other is for biological reasons not all but many flowers attract what i call the three p's pollinators native and non-native bees uh, predators and parasitoids 
Predators and parasitoids are basically beneficial insects. Predatory wasps, certain winged beetles, uh, ladybugs, and things like that. Uh, so what you're offering when you grow flowers is uh, a food source for these uh, beneficial insects. Pollen and nectar, protein and carbohydrates, the kind of two basic building blocks of any diet. They, if, you, if you grow flowers, they will come. The flower is simply an attraction. It says to the pollinator or winged insect, you, you come over here, you're gonna get a reward. Again, what's that reward? Pollen and nectar, food. Um, so uh, some flowers that can be grown at this time of year uh, would be uh, a thing called Ami Magis. It's basically a flowering uh, carrot, beautiful white top thing. Agrostemma, it's a carnation relative, beautiful kind of lilac mauvey thing. Calendula, cornflower, Sorinthe, which is related to borage, is beautiful blue like that. Um, uh, the genus Deanthus contains two good fall winter uh, crops. One is the, the cutting carnation, and they're not the big monstrosities that are scentless that you see at Safeway and at the floor shop. They're small and scented. Uh, the, the common nickname for old fashioned carnations is clove spice pink, and indeed they have a clove like spicy scent. And another member of that Deanthus genus is uh, Sweet Williams, uh, which come on, we plant them now, they come on around. March or April. Uh, beautiful uh, plant called Canterbury Bells, tall, four foot tall, with nodding uh, bells like that. Fall is the time to establish sweet peas. Um, sow them in September, October, and again, again in January and in Feb. If you're wanting early sweet peas, there's a class or a line of sweet peas called Elegance. Elegance Chiffon, Elegance Watermelon, Elegance White, name the color. Uh, and they're just, they're, they're short day varieties. Uh, if you start them in September, October, they'll be in bloom December and January. Um, uh, and uh, sweet pea is actually my favorite flower, so uh, I could go on about that. Um, uh, larkspurs and, and nigella are good at this time of year for late winter, early uh, spring bloom. And a thing uh, called uh, the pincushion flower, scabiosa, is a uh, just a prodigious producers of uh, these kind of, they, they do look, the flowers do look a bit like a pink cushion. Uh, it comes in a nice white, a good sky blue, nice dark deep purple and a fiery red. Um, so yeah, flowers too. We have a couple of questions about different um, vegetables or fruits that might grow here. Um, okay. They are rhubarb, collard greens, kiwis, gooseberries, and mustard greens. Yep. All of those will grow here. <laughs> yeah, okay, go back again. Uh, <laughs> read them off. I'll say a few more words about each. Rhubarb? Uh, rhubarb. Yeah, uh, make sure you want rhubarb because that crown of the plant is going to enlarge and enlarge and enlarge and it'll be there well, forever. Uh, but they're great. Uh, uh, again, the red varieties are preferred uh, uh, because they have a red stem. The stem is edible. The, uh, the Latin name for rhubarb is ruum palmatum, a big hand-like leaf like that. The leaves are toxic. You just use the stalks uh, like that. Uh, boy, uh, they're just bulletproof. <laughs> might take a year, or may, uh, two years to get them established, but the uh, just water them a little bit. They grow great here. And, and uh, strawberry rhubarb uh, pie or cobbler in the spring is tough to beat. What was the next one? Oh, and when do you plant rhubarb? I uh, usually can get crowns. That's a, you know, dormant root pieces in the uh, late winter, early spring when the fruit trees come in, Jan, Feb, March at the garden centers. Uh, uh, collard greens. Collard greens are a great summer into fall crop. They like it a little warmer than, than not. Uh, you might be able to sneak in another round here. Uh, before the fall, but yeah, they grow great in Santa Cruz. And a favorite variety of collard green? Uh, no. Okay. They're all, they're all about the same. They're all pretty good. Um, any tips for growing hardy kiwis? Uh, we can grow the uh, regular kiwis. We don't need to grow the hardy fuzzy kiwis here. Uh, Hayward is probably the variety of choice to grow. Uh, and after all these years, I don't think there is a better one. Uh, now you need a male and a female plant. Actually, you need one male plant for eight females for pollination purposes. So if you just want one plant, you gotta get two. Uh, and you can, they sell them as male and then Hayward's the variety uh, 
uh, of choice. They'll need a pretty good, strong, sturdy trellis. Gooseberries? Will gooseberries grow here? Yeah, gooseberries and currants. I just love them, but you know, maybe we should, I'm going to retire to Sweden and I can grow them better there. <laughs> uh, we just don't get enough of a chill here. I, for years at both the farm and garden, we researched every variety you could and yeah, we'd get a few and they were great, but it was just a few. It's just not a climate that's well suited to either currants or gooseberries. Okay. Uh, mustard greens? Mustard greens, yeah. Uh, uh, pretty much the year round. Uh, they're great. Uh, again, uh, there's a standard uh, mustard greens we associate with the cuisine of the South and they're umpteen Asian uh, mustard greens and they're all good. Green Wave is probably your, your best standard American uh, mustard. Okay. Will uh, ginger or lemongrass grow well here? Uh, <laughs> sorry. In the 70s, I planted a ginger root. In the early 2000s, it was still about that big. Uh, uh, if you have a really warm microclimate, you know, Bonnie Dune maybe, and not too much frost, uh, or coralitos, you might be able to grow them acceptably well. Uh, lemongrass, it's just you know, it's a sick puppy, unfortunately. All right, do you have a best variety of pod peas? Uh, yeah, Maxi Gold, M-A-X-I-G-O-L-T. It's the only one to grow, in my opinion, from Johnny's. And uh, best herbs or spices? I know someone who grows a ton of shiitakes in their west side yard. Whoa. Is that hard or does it take long or are there other better mushrooms? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I should go apprentice to that individual. I have no idea. how. They, I mean, you can buy the kits in the logs, but uh, we should have a workshop at that person's house. Uh, for, uh, let's see. Um, and what was the thing about herbs and spices? Oh, best herbs or spices to grow for fall winter? Um, you can push cilantro pretty well into the fall. Um, perennial herbs such as marjoram, thyme, rosemary, great. Basil, better stick plants in the ground in the next two or three weeks. And sometimes you can have a nice basil crop. Uh, Bragging rights, you can have fresh pesto for Thanksgiving dinner. Um, uh, they don't like wet leaves, so as soon as the rains start, they get uh, black sooty mold on them and they quit. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, there's some. And uh, were there any mushroom suggestions besides the shiitakes? Uh, my uh, experience with mu mushrooms is uh, limited and underfed. <laughs> so. so you're saying you would come to a, a mushroom growing program if, I, if we hosted one? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it looks like this might be the last question. Uh, do avocado trees grow here? Avocado, uh, avocado trees grow well here. Um, probably uh, the best are the forte types, the smooth skin types, the uh, uh, richer kind of black uh, 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 wrinkle skin types do okay. One good one though is called lambs. And it's uh, an actually, for an avocado, a dwarf tree only gets about 15 feet tall. Let me just say that most avocados will get 20, 30, 40 feet tall. They take a long time to begin cropping, maybe eight to 10 years. They're really easy to grow. If you have good drainage, you don't have to do much but water them. But it's a long, slow thing and it's kind of uh, space intensive. Uh, but the lamb's uh, avocado is good. There's this thing advertised as a dwarf avocado called Lil apostrophe LLL, little cotto. And um, it's a small uh, tree with a small fruit that has a big pit. I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, I did miss one question. Um, I would like to grow a dyer's garden. Are there any good dye plants I can sow or plant in the fall? Uh, here's the classic instructor's dodge. That's beyond the scope of today's presentation. <laughs> Oh, my knowledge base. <laughs> I, I know nothing about dye plants, unfortunately. So maybe I could read a little short poem here at the end. Would that be okay? Please do. Okay, I want to end with this short poem. It's by a man who's one of my favorite poets, William Stafford. And fortunately, about 10 years ago, his grandson came and was an apprentice at the farm. And, 
and so that was rich. And his poems often seem deceptively simple. They often, but they, they contain both a distinctive and more complex vision upon closer examination. <clears throat> so along the lines of affirmation, a poem entitled, Yes, by William Stafford. It could happen any time, tornado, earthquake, Armageddon. It could happen, or sunshine, love, salvation. It could, you know. That is why we wake and look out, no guarantees in this life, but some bonuses, like morning, like right now, like noon, like evening. All right, folks, good evening. Thank you, Oren, so much. That was um, very enlightening, very engaging. Um, okay. Much appreciated. Let me extend my disclaimer. Someday we'll open back up at the UC Farm and Garden, and we have tons of workshops, and they're really much better in three dimensions. <laughs> Plus, we do tastings. Oh, excellent. Right. Have a good evening. Got to go catch the giants. Uh, thank you all again. And uh, hopefully you guys check out some more library programs and uh, have a nice the rest of your week.